Okay, so you want to be a chef, a commencement address. We're calling every student's line cooks looking to move up in the world, newcomers to the business and the otherwise unemployables who make up so much of our workforce. I have a few nuggets of advice to boil down wisdom of 25 years of doing it right and doing wrong in the restaurant industry. For the growing number of people who are considering becoming a professional chef as a second career, I have some advice too. In fact, let's dispose of you first. So you want to be a chef, you really, really want to be a chef. You've been working in another line of business, have been accustomed to working eight to nine hour days, weekends, and even off, and evenings off. Holidays with the family, regular sex with your significant other. If you are used to being treated with some modicum of dignity, spoken to and interacted with as a human being, seen as an equal, a sensitive, multidimensional entity with hopes, dreams, aspirations, and opinions, the sort of qualities you expect most of, you expect most working persons, then maybe you should reconsider what you'll be facing when you graduate from whatever six month course put this nonsense in your head to start with. I wasn't kidding when I said earlier that at least in the beginning, you have no rights, are not entitled to an opinion or personality, can fully expect to be treated as cattle, only less useful. Believe it, I wish I had a dollar for every well-meaning career changer who attended a six-month course and showed up to be an extern in my kitchen. More often than not, one look at what they would be spending their first few months doing, one look at what their schedule would be, and they ran away in terror. Those serious ones who know what it is they are entering who are fully prepared, ready, willing, and able and committed to a career path like Say Scott Bryan's who wants to be chefs, must be chefs, whatever the personal costs and physical demands, and I have to say this to you. Welcome to my world and consider these suggestions as to your conduct, attitude, and preparation for the path you intend to follow. One, be fully committed. Be fully committed. Don't be a fence sitter or a waffler. If you're going to be a chef, then be sure about it, single-minded in your determination to achieve victory at all costs. I think you might find yourself standing in a salad prep kitchen one day after turning or turning 200 potatoes. Wonder if you made the right move or if some busy night on a grill station you find yourself doubting the wisdom of your chosen path. Then you will be a liability to yourself and others. You are, for all intents and purposes, entering the military. Ready yourself to follow orders, give orders when necessary, and live with the outcome of those orders without complaint. Be ready to lead, follow, or get out of the way. Learn Spanish. I can't stress this enough. That number two, learn Spanish. Much of the workforce in the industry you're about to enter is Spanish speaking. The very backbone of the industry, whether you like it or not, is inexpensive Mexican, Dominican, Salvadorian, Ecuadorian labor, most of whom could cook you under the table without breaking a sweat. If you can't communicate, develop relationships, understand instructions, and pass them along, then you're at a tremendous disadvantage. Should you become a leader, Spanish is absolutely essential. <laughs> Also learn as much as you can about the distinct cultures, histories, and geographies in Mexico, Salvador, Ecuador, and the Dominican Republic. A cook from Puebla is different in background from a cook from Mexico City. Someone who fled El Salvador to get away from the Mono Blanco is not likely to get along with the right-wing Cuban working next to him. These are your coworkers, your friends, the people you will be counting on, leaning on for much of your career. And they in turn will be looking at you and hold up your end. Show them some respect by bothering to know them, learn their language, eat their food, and will be personally rewarding and professionally invaluable. Number three, don't steal. In fact, don't do anything that you couldn't take a polygraph test over. If you're a chef who drinks too many freebies at the bar, takes home the occasional steak for the wife, or smokes a wine but in the off hours, be fully prepared to admit this unapologetically to any and all. Presumably, your idiosyncrasies will, on balance, make you no less a chef to your employers and employees. If you're a sneak and a liar, however, it will follow you forever. This is a small business. Everybody knows everybody else. You will do yourself immeasurable harm. Don't ever take kickbacks or bribes from a purveyor. They'll end up owing, owning you, and you will have sold off your best asset as a chef, your honesty, reliability, and integrity. In a business where these are frequently rare and valuable qualities, temptation, of course, is everywhere. When you're when you're a hungry, underpaid line cook, those filet mignons you're searing off by the dozens look mighty good. Pill for one, pill for one, and you're bent. Ask for one, for Christ's sake. You'll probably get one. If they won't let you have one, you're probably working in the wrong place. Faking petty cash vouchers, stealing food, colluding with a purveyor or a co-worker is extraordinarily easy. Avoid it, really. I was bent for the first half of my career, meaning I pilfered food, turned into the occasional inflated petty cash slip, nicked beer for the kitchen. It didn't feel good sneaking home at the end of the night knowing that you're a thief, whatever your excuse. My boss is a thief. <clears throat> I need the money. I'll never notice. It feels lousy and it can come back to bite you later in your career. 
Recently, I agreed to meet with a representative from a major seafood wholesaler. I met him at the empty bar of my restaurant during the slow time between lunch and dinner and told him that I'd done business with this company at another restaurant. I was, I was inclined to like the company. The products and services had in my experience so far have been first rate, and what he needed to do to get my business was simply provide the same or better quality fish, fish as my other purveyors and do so at a lower price. Better quality fish. I meant it, too. I'm absolutely tone deaf to criminal solicitation. It bores me. For all my misbehavior over the years, I have never, and I mean never, taken money or a thing of value from a purveyor in return for my master's business. Junior, that was his name from X Seafood, seemed puzzled by my apparent obtuseness that day. Thick-necked, crew-cutted, but also friendly. Junior seemed to think that maybe we were talking about sex when, in fact, all the while we were discussing the internal combustion engine. There were long silences as his gentle, cheerful probes and expressions of non-specific non good will were uh, left dangling in the air. After a while of this, me wanting only to know how much he was charging for Norwegian salmon today and resisting his unspoken entreaties suddenly to muse aloud about how maybe it would be nice if I could afford a hot tub for my apartment. He gave up in frustration and left. Minutes later, a waiter drew my attention to a plain white envelope on the floor opening it, i found a stack of 100 dollars bills and a list of nearby hotels and restaurants with some names checked off junior had apparently dropped it i have to tell you i felt pretty damn good calling up senior down at x seafood and breezily informing him that his son seemed to have left something behind by mistake in my restaurant could they please send someone to pick it up a red-faced functionary picked the envelope up within minutes and i never heard that company again all sorts of scumbags will offer you every variety of free stuff if you entertain the prospect of doing business with them Slipping them food or looking the other way. Screw them all. Don't even play footsie with them, meaning. I'll take the case of Dom, but I don't know if I can always do business with you. Don't even do that. There are a lot of scumbags in the restaurant business, people who will let the Gambino family decide who gets the fish order or the liquor order in return for Nick's tickets or a lap dance. And these are people who you have to deal with sometimes adversarially. How can you win an argument with one of these people when you're a scumbag too? Number four, always be on time. Number five, never make excuses or blame others. Six, never call them sick. Except in cases of dismemberment, arterial bleeding, sucking chest wounds, or the death of an immediate family member. Granny died, but we on your own day. Seven, lazy, sloppy, and slow are bad. Enterprising, crafty, and hyperactive are good. Eight, be prepared to witness every variety of human folly and injustice. Without us screwing up your head or poisoning your attitude, you will simply have to endure the contradictions and inequities of this life. You will have to simply endure the contradictions and, and inequities of this life. Why does that brain damaged, lazy ass busboy take home more money than me? The goddamn sous chef should not be a question that drives you to tears of rage and frustration. It will just be like that sometimes. Accept it. Why is he, she treated better than me? How come the chef gets to loiter in the dining room playing kissy face with insert minor celebrity here while I'm working my ass off? Why is my hard work and dedication not sufficiently appreciated? These are all questions left best unasked. The answers will drive you insane eventually. If you keep asking yourself questions like these, you will find yourself slipping into martyr mode, unemployment, alcoholism, drug addiction, and death. Number nine, assume the worst about everybody, but don't let this poison outlook affect your job performance. Let it all roll off your back. Ignore it. Be amused by what you see and suspect. Just because someone you work with is a miserable, treacherous, self-serving, capricious, and corrupt asshole and shouldn't prevent you from enjoying his company, working with him, or finding him entertaining. This business grows assholes. It's our principal export. I'm an asshole. You should probably be an asshole, too. 10. Try not to lie. Remember, this is the restaurant business. No matter how bad it is, everybody probably has heard worse. Forget to place the produce here. Don't lie about it. You made a mistake. Admit it and move on. Just don't do it again, ever. 11. Avoid restaurants where the owner's name is over the door. Avoid restaurants that smell bad. Avoid restaurants with names that will look funny or pathetic on your resume. 12. Think about that resume. How will it look to the, ch the chef weeding through a stack of faxes if you never worked in one place longer than six months if the years 95 to 97 are unaccounted for? If you worked as sandwich chef at Happy Malone's Cheerful Chicken, maybe you shouldn't mention that. And please, if you appeared as Bud in Daytime Soap Opera or played the narrator, and the summer stock production of our town, leave it off the resume. Nobody cares except the chef who won't be hiring anyone with delusions of thespian greatness. Under reasons for leaving last job, never give the real reason unless it's money or ambition. The 13. Read. Read cookbooks, trade magazines. I recommend food arts 
Savoir and Restaurant Business magazines. They are useful for staying abreast of industry trends and for pinching recipes and concepts. Some awareness of the history of your business is useful too. It allows you to put your own miserable circumstances in perspective when you examine and appreciate the full sweep of culinary history. Orwell's Down and Out in Paris and London is invaluable. As are Nicholas Freeling's The Kitchen, David Bloom's Flash and Pan, the Batterberry's fine account of American restaurant history, on the town of New York and Joseph Mitchell's up in the old hotel. Read the old masters of Scofier, Bulk Hughes, etc. A.L. As well as the Young Turks, Keller, Marco, Pierre White, and more recent generations of innovators and craftsmen. 14. Have a sense of humor about things. You'll need it. I think I might have read that one down and out in Paris and London. Orwell. I think I'm reading Orwell right now, aren't I? 1984? <laughs> I'll probably read that one down and out in Paris again. Anyway, uh, peace.